Hi, and welcome to Women in Business Podcast, hosted by Rose Vitale. Have you ever wondered why men have more success in getting funding for their businesses than women do? There is a serious lack of information available for women business owners and women investors. We're on a mission to change that. Every week, the Women in Business Podcast gives women entrepreneurs and investors a platform to share their stories. Our guests open up about their successes, failures, and lessons learned. Join us as we work together to help women grow their businesses and be Become successful investors. Today, I'm going to be talking about a very interesting topic with a very interesting individual. The topic today is going to be how to be an alpha female in the investment community. My guest, Evan Katz, is the CEO of Crawford Ventures. He also graduated from Harvard Law School and Wharton Business School. He's the twice elected director of Hedge Fund Association and board director from 2014 to 2019. He's received numerous financial and Wall Street awards and honors. He's also an expert at raising capital for a variety of funds. So welcome to the show. I appreciate it. Let's talk about this. This is such an interesting topic. Well, hey, Rose, it's great to be with you and uh, look forward to the conversation. Yeah, so tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved into this space? Well, I definitely did not get into alternative investments and hedge funds and fundraising through the normal route. You know, the normal route is people graduate B school, go work on Wall Street, and somehow move to hedge funds and fundraising. Uh, I actually was a lawyer. I uh, grew up on Long Island. As you mentioned, I went to Wharton and Harvard Law School. Uh, Actually, the same class as Michelle Obama. We were in the same year at Harvard, small world. And I practiced intellectual property law, meaning patents, trademarks, copyrights, computer, and internet law. And I was minding my own business, basically, as a successful, uh, accomplished intellectual property lawyer. Uh, And I discovered that I was pretty good at fundraising. Uh, Several clients of mine had funds or operating companies that were looking for investors. And I had a pretty wide network of family office and institutional investors that I had met over the years. And discovered while I was a good lawyer and did a great job at that, I was actually even a better uh, fundraiser at raising money for my clients' funds and operating companies. And after doing that pretty successfully for a while, uh, gave up the law, made the switch to uh, hedge funds and private equity and alternative investments, although I still have a law license and do the CLE every year. So still have both. Oh, that's awesome. I love that because, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I wanted you know, to get you on the show is because I kind of found that unique. You were an attorney and then you switched to, uh, you know, the, the, the real money maker. <laughs> Just these things. So let's talk a little bit about what you mean about being an alpha female in the investment community. Sure. Well, the term alpha female uh, is sort of a, I guess, a play on words a little bit between alpha male uh, meaning the aggressive uh, testosterone stereotypical male, especially in the hedge fund and Wall Street arena, and the term alpha, which uh, means return attributable to a manager's skill rather than just what the market does. So in, in the hedge fund world, for example, uh, if the market is up 5% one year and a particular manager or fund is up 15%, well, the additional 10% is his or her skill or alpha, and the other 5% is what the market did. And so it seemed like an interesting topic of conversation because uh, it is uh, an interesting take whether uh, women should try to be men on Wall Street or just should be themselves. And uh, so the term alpha female is sort of a bit of a play on words between alpha male and the term alpha as in hedge funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. And so what type of of funds do you raise capital for? Well, pretty much... uh, all types of funds, mostly alternatives, mostly hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds, and real estate funds. Although I, I joked if uh, if anyone can find me a fund with a great track record and a great team, no matter what they do, uh, we would take a look at that too. But it's mostly alternatives, mostly hedge, private equity, uh, venture capital, and, uh, and real estate. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what investors look for when they actually invest in a fund. Sure. Well, it's it's changed over time, but I think that One of the uh, things that's pretty stayed constant over the roughly 15 years I've been doing this are uh, what they call the three P's, and some people may have a fourth P. Uh, Basically, the first P is performance. 
that is a track record either at the current firm or at a prior shop because obviously uh, if a manager or fund has been losing money every month or every year, it doesn't matter uh, how good the rest of the story is. So the first P is performance, again, either at the current shop or track record from a prior shop. Uh, the second P is uh, the word pedigree. I, I'm not a big fan of the word pedigree. I always think of dogs and a dog's pedigree. But you know, it basically means where did that manager come out of him or her or his or her team? You know, did they come out of a major hedge fund or Wall Street firm? you know, Goldman Sachs or a Morgan Stanley or Brevin Howard or a Bridgewater, where they came from. And the third P uh, typically is process, uh, as the British say, process, uh, meaning infrastructure, repeatable edge, you know, that is to say, uh, sort of the nuts and bolts, uh, the operations of the firm, uh, because uh, typically investors these days are not investing in a one or two man uh, band or a one or two woman band. You've got to have some infrastructure in place uh, people, a repeatable edge, a process, risk controls, things like that. So, so again, the three P's, performance, pedigree, and uh, pr process, as the British say. Yeah, it makes sense. You, you support a lot of women in the investment world. So talk to us a little bit about your experience with this. Well, you know, it, it was interesting. I guess, you know, the first time uh, it ever crossed my mind was when I was at Wharton. Uh, I went to Wharton Business School. I was undergrad there. And, uh, you know, thinking about it today, uh, when more than half of medical schools are women, uh, back then when I went to Wharton, uh, the percentage of women, and it's a bit from memory, was probably roughly about 15 to 20 percent. And it always struck me as a little bit unusual when women are half the population and half uh, of academia, you know, why they would be you know, 15 to 20 percent at the business school. So ever since then, I've always sort of kept an eye out to try to mentor women where possible, hire women where possible, and invest in women-run funds where possible. Uh, so for example, you know, one of the things that we do is we try to attend as many hedge fund and Wall Street events as we can, uh, including even events that are put on by some of the women's organizations, try to meet as many women as possible and consider them for, uh, you know, for hiring decisions when we're hiring, uh, similarly for women-run funds. Uh, we have relationships with about a thousand endowments, foundations, and you know some of them specifically have uh, allocations targeted for women-led funds or women-run funds. But for at least many of them, it is a consideration. I mean, obviously, you know they've got to be quality funds with a quality team. But we and a lot of our investors are keeping an eye out for women-run funds specifically, and to hire you know great women uh, where possible. Yeah, I appreciate that insight. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about. How is capital raising for, you know, let's say a private equity or a venture fund versus a hedge fund different? Sure. It's a, it's a pretty similar situation. I mean, the three P's, uh, performance, pedigree, and process are, are pretty similar. There's obviously different technical things that differ between hedge, venture, and private equity. Probably one of the biggest differences, though, uh, which some funds don't appreciate when they're starting out is that well, a lot of the issues are similar uh, and the check boxes are similar. There's different professionals at the institutional investors and even at the family offices that look at hedge versus private equity versus venture. So, you know, one of the critical things, and we'll get into this a bit later, is how to successfully raise capital for your fund. Uh, one of the main things is make sure that you have a fundraiser who has longstanding relationships with the people specifically for your strategy, whether it's hedge, private equity, or venture. So, you know, the greatest success stories we've seen is where, you know, funds hire a fundraiser who knows uh, the private equity allocators because he or she is working at a private equity fund. Uh, and the biggest disasters we've seen is when funds hire their friend, their cousin, someone who's recommended who may have been a great fundraiser for hedge or private equity, but doesn't know the people at the uh, allocators who are allocating to their strategy because they used to do a different strategy. So that, that's one critical difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I also saw that you wrote 44 top fundraising secrets and tips of the trade. Let's talk a little bit about this. Sure. Uh, actually, the, the backstory here was pretty interesting. There was a leading family office and investor conference every year as a couple of hundred family offices and investors and funds and companies looking to pitch to them. And I've been giving this talk every year at this pretty big event, a couple of hundred people. And, and originally the title was uh, Top Tips from A to Z, 26 Tips and Tips of the Trade. Uh, 
and uh, I agreed with the conference organizers to do that. And then I hung up the phone and said, well, I won't repeat it on the air, but uh oh, uh, 26 tips. Do I have 26 things to say about raising capital? Well, it turns out the first version of, of the pitch uh, actually did have 26 tips and tricks for raising capital for funds. And now we're up to uh, 44, which I think is double R. So uh, next year, uh, post coronavirus, when we have the next conference, uh, I think we'll be up to 52 tips of the tray. That'll be A through double Z. Uh, and we're going to uh, call it quits and pull the curtain down at 52 because uh, cause, uh, double Z is enough. And if you want, I'm, you know, I'm happy to share you know, some of these uh, with you and your listeners, uh, if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what what are what would you say is your top maybe five? Uh, sure. Uh, if you'll indulge me, maybe I'll give maybe six or seven. But uh, I mean, obviously, uh, have a great team and great documents. And I'm not going to belabor that. That's pretty that's pretty obvious. I would say probably the, the five or ten most important things in, in rough sort of chronological order are first. Uh, Hire a fundraiser who knows the investors already. You know, a lot of emerging managers and even some established folks who come out of you know, major prop shops or Wall Street firms uh, think that they can just do it themselves uh, and just start cold calling investors. And you know, I've often said you, do, you don't do it yourself uh, with your hernia surgery or anything else like that. Uh, don't try to do it yourself on the fundraising. You know, hire a dedicated fundraiser who has relationships with the specific allocators you're trying to reach for five, 10, or 15 years. Uh, we've done studies on this. He or she, who has the relationships already, will get orders of magnitude more investments than you will cold calling. We've actually done studies on this. And it's not surprising. The allocators get hundreds, some thousands of pitches every year. And the best kept secret or the worst kept secret is they get flooded with emails. And typically, they don't have the time to read emails from people they don't already know. So. Uh, don't try to be your own doctor. Don't try to be your own lawyer. If you want to raise a lot of money, hire an experienced fundraiser, someone he or she who's done this before for your specific type of strategy, for your specific type of fund, and at your specific type of stage, and you'll raise orders of magnitude more money in vastly less time than if you start trying to cold call. And the other thing also, too, is you're supposed to be running a fund and putting up great returns, whatever your strategy is. You can't be spending 50, 60 hours a week running a great fund and 50, 60 hours a week calling investors. So for, for all of those reasons, hire someone, let them do it. You'll raise a lot more money in a lot less time. So I guess uh, that would be number, uh, that'd be number one or maybe one or two. Uh, the second thing I would say is stick with standard fund structures, places of incorporation and standard terms. You know, I've seen some great funds in my day uh, across the board, hedge, venture, private equity, who had different unique fee structures, who they said were better for investors. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. Uh, sometimes a founder lives in Ohio and is an Ohio uh, LLC. And the bottom line is this, investors are swamped. They're getting tons of pitches. Uh, as the golfers say, do it straight down the fairway, stick to known structures, Delaware entities, Cayman entities for your offshore fund, standard hedge fund term, standard private equity firms, because the downside is if you don't, and I've experienced this, you know, what I told some of these funds is we're going to spend half of our calls discussing your unique structure, your unique fees, and the, the nuances of Ohio LLCs. And the ones that didn't listen learned the hard way. We're spending half of our call not on why they were a great investment and why allocators should allocate to them and what are your wire instructions, but we spent half of the call discussing the unique structure the unique fees and so forth. So keep it simple. Do the usual structures, the usual fees, and the usual places of incorporation. So that that's number uh, that's number two, I would say. Uh, another one, and, and this is probably I've seen on nobody else's list, is get to know, be kind to, and be respectful of the administrative assistance for the allocators you are working with. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the administrative assistants are the ones who set up the meetings, a lot of the calls. And shockingly, there are some people on Wall Street and some portfolio managers, believe it or not, who have pretty big egos. And some yeah. of them think, uh, hard to imagine, isn't it, that uh, uh, that they rule the world and everybody else works for them. And uh, I have uh, seen people very successfully be polite and respectful, uh, get many meetings set up. Uh, obviously, if your fund is horrible and your returns are horrible, it doesn't matter who knows who and how nice you are to anybody. But it can make a huge difference, everything else being equal, uh, if you are respectful of administrative assistance uh, and are polite to them, 
and treat them with respect, uh, and you will get a lot more meetings, a lot more calls, and a lot more allocations uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds simple, um, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, as simple as it is, I think that sometimes um, you're right. Um, people don't tend to focus on that. Uh, per, you know, precisely. A lot of times uh, folks, especially PMs who are making a lot of money uh, or want to make a lot of money, give a bit short shrift uh, to people and can be a bit brusque, and there's never an excuse for doing that with anybody uh, at all. Uh, third point I would make also, too, is uh, make a fund video. Uh, we live in an age of YouTube. Everyone has cell phones. People have downtime on their commutes. People, uh, when we get back to traveling by airplane after coronavirus, we'll be traveling by airplanes again. They've got time in the airports and on trains and on subways. And if you make a good fund video, and I mean two, maximum three minutes that explains who you are, what your strategy is, who your team is, and why you're in great investment opportunity can go a long way. We've done this extremely successfully with funds and firms. And you know, people might ask, well, what does a fund video add to the mix that good documents don't already uh, give to the mix? And the answer is, it gives investors what I call a free look at your fund and your firm. Because right now, the investors read your documents and they have a, a fork in the road and a choice to make. Do they commit to a call and spend, let's call it 30 minutes preparing for the call and 30 minutes on the call? That's an hour. And when they've got hundreds or thousands of pitches, that can be a lot of time. If you make a fund video and let them know that it's two to three minutes in length, you will get a lot more investors making a two to three minute commitment versus an hour commitment. And if your fund video is as good as your documents and explains why you're a compelling investment opportunity, you will appreciably increase the number of investor calls, meetings you get, and the resulting allocations for that. And I would say that the vast majority of funds we know and have worked with have not done it. We think it's a great idea. And we've been told by investors, you know, they like it too. You know, keep it simple, keep it straightforward, keep it professional, but uh, it'll get you a lot more meetings, a lot more allocations as well. Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. And, so uh, let's talk a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, but can I sneak in two more? Sure, sure. Let's hear them. Uh, all right. Two or three more pet peeves. And this is just amazing that some people don't quite get this. And I have funds, you know, because I get pitched to invest in funds all the time as well. So I've seen best practices and worst practices. Uh, two or three other uh, best practices or things to avoid. Uh, don't email investors at night or over the weekend. Uh, I just find it shocking how many people don't consider this. Maybe they're in a different time zone. Maybe they're working over the weekend. Uh, maybe they're working at night. Okay. But you want people to read your emails. And you email them over the weekend, they get buried by the next business day. Don't do it. Uh, I work a lot of nights. I work a lot of weekends. Every major email program, uh, standalone or system or CRM, has a function where you can work all night or work all weekend and tell the app, send this email out the next business day at 10 or 10.30 in the morning, local time to your person. So if you want to increase the number of calls and meetings allocations and you're emailing with Europe, don't send them emails at five o'clock New York time if it's midnight in Europe. Uh, it's, it seems so incredibly obvious, but I'm amazed at how many people uh, miss that too. And maybe just one or two other things regarding emails. In your email header, put something in your email header about how why your fund is great, your track record, your returns, a couple of lines to get people to open your email. And then in your email, use bullet points, say a few reasons, again, track record, pedigree, process, credentials, why they should, in effect, invest their time to open up your documents. You know, I get plenty of emails from funds that are pitching me. Uh, some of them are very short, you know, see our attached update. Well, that's being presumptuous. Why should I spend my time to read their update? You haven't told me why I should invest my time to open up your update. So give them a couple of reasons and a couple of bullet points. But the opposite is also true. You know, don't make it too long. I've gotten emails from some funds that are pitching me where they want me to raise money for them. And instead of five or six or seven bullet points, you know, the thing goes on for three or four printed pages. And so, you know, that's just an obvious, you know, an obvious no-no. Uh, and I would say last but not least, and this is just something else I've learned too from being on the receiving end, uh, do not repeatedly call investors until they pick up. Uh, it's shocking how many people don't realize investors have caller ID too. And I've had people call me dozens of times within a one week period trying to get me to invest in their fund or to raise capital for them. 
And I'm just shocked at how some people don't realize that, yeah, we've all got caller ID and people don't like you calling 12 times in a week to try to get them to buy something or to raise money for them. So, so basically be polite, uh, call once a month, email once a month. And it's what's something that I call polite persistence. And I kind of do it on a TikTok basis. If you call once a month and email once a month, you're reaching them every other week. No one's going to call you a pest. And most investors will tell you no if the answer is no or not now if the answer is not now or call me back when if they want you to have achieved some other milestone. And uh, so I, I call it polite persistence. And investors have said they love the term because you know fundraising is an interesting thing. It's not like dating. In dating, if someone doesn't return three or four of your calls, he or she is not interested, get over it and move on. That's not necessarily the case in investing. People are swamped, people are busy, they're dealing with investment committees, travel schedules, board meetings. Most investors will tell you no if they're not interested because they don't want to get your next call, your next email. Uh, so be persistent, but be polite. And you know, calling once a month is one thing, but don't call 12 times a week until they pick up because they've got caller ID too. So those are sort of maybe a half dozen or so of the le lesser obvious points and the entire PowerPoint, uh, all 44 tips and tricks is on the uh, Crawford Ventures uh, website in the middle of the page in a big box. So it's crawfordventures.com and you can download it. It's actually become one of the most downloaded PowerPoints about how to raise capital and it's been downloaded, I think, well over a thousand times by now. So it's free on our website. I'll definitely put it uh, a link on my uh, on your blog post that I have on our site as well. You know, this brings me to a next question that um, in your, you know, answering these questions here, uh, how do you determine um, if you're going to raise capital for uh, a fund? I'm sure you get approached a lot uh, to raise, fun, you know, funds for somebody's fund. Um, how do you decide on who you take on and not take on? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a fantastic question. We do get several hundred funds a year, hedge, venture, private equity, real estate, asking us to raise capital for them. We, and we've got relationships with about a thousand allocators. So it's a it's a good place to be in where we sit. Uh, I mean, the usual answer I say is we raise funds, uh, we raise capital for funds if they laugh at my jokes. Uh, that's one answer. You know, But more seriously, uh, we put ourselves in our investors' shoes and we say, how compelling is the fund? So out of the several funds we see every year, you know, is their track record top quartile, top decile? Uh, how unique is the strategy? Is it very similar to other funds we've seen? Uh, how correlated or not correlated are they to the S&P or their uh, other hedge funds or private equity funds? Uh, are And other things that are much more sort of soft skills too. Uh, do they show up at meetings and are they on phone calls when we schedule them? I, Rose, I cannot tell you how many funds have asked us to raise capital for us and we end up having to have several cancellations on their part, postponements of meeting, postponements of call. They take forever to get us documents. And I'll say to them quite candidly, listen, you know, with me, uh, I don't appreciate having meetings scheduled and calls moved around, but do you realize that if we do this with investors, you'll never get a second chance? If you don't show up for meetings on time, if you don't answer questions fully and timely, uh, and that doesn't mean you have to have 100 answers to 100 questions. You can give them answers to 90 questions on a call and get back to them on the other 10. That's totally fine. Uh, so you know, that's one of the things, too, because uh, if they don't have their house in order, uh, if they can't make meetings when scheduled, if they don't provide documents, it, it's a huge red flag to me. It makes it you know, much uh, less likely that we're going to take them on as a client. And also, too, uh, are they open to suggestion? You know, investors will often say, uh, say, for example, an ODD, on operation of due diligence. We don't tell investors no because of most ODD issues. We tell them yes, but, or if you, but, you know, meaning, hey, we like a lot of things you're doing, but here's a handful of things that we think you need improvement on your operational side. Uh, and so when I work with managers, not only do I go through the whole overview of their investment process and procedure, but also their operations, their compliance, and so forth. And a lot of managers are very thankful for that, and they're very grateful that they've got somebody telling them uh, how to become more attractive to investors, uh, and therefore how eventually I, they, and we are going to raise a lot more capital. Conversely, there are some managers who kind of don't want to hear about it or kind of give operations or ODD a bit of short shrift. And so again, if we start getting responses like that, it makes it a lot less likely we're going to raise capital for them because you know, post 2008, post crisis, it became very clear 
uh, you could have great returns, but if you don't have a reasonably solid team and a reasonably solid infrastructure for a fund of your size, it's going to be extremely hard to attract capital. And again, that doesn't mean that if you're a hundred or two hundred million dollar hedge fund manager, you have to have the same infrastructure as a one or two billion dollar hedge fund or private equity manager. We all get that, but you know, a lot of this is just an attitude. So we look for managers with a great team, cooperative, a good attitude, dot the I's, cross the T's, take things seriously, show up for meetings on time. And if they laugh at my jokes at the end of the day, that's even better. And most do. That's what we look for. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about something our listeners would find very interesting about you. Uh, sure. Well, uh, that's hard to say. I mean, aside from the... Uh, all the boilerplate on our website and all the alternative investment and Wall Street stuff. Uh, if I had to say a couple of things that uh, people in the industry probably don't know, uh, and you know, as we go through this coronavirus pandemic, people have been you know, doing a lot of Zoom calls from home and talking about a bit more personal stuff. Uh, the, the two things that I could probably disclose uh, publicly, uh, number one, uh, my wife and I are big cyclists, meaning uh, bicyclists. We love to go biking on every vacation. We fight in France. We fight in California. Uh, we're not uh, crazy with the spandex and 100 miles a day, but we, we, we keep it fun and we do enjoy cycling. And the other one is that uh, my wife and I actually had a wine-themed wedding, which was uh, wonderful and everything was wine-themed. And that's a long story, but it was really uh, uh, very nice. And everybody got a bottle of wine with our picture on it and a lot of other things that were wine-related through, uh, through the course of the evening. Yeah, no wonder you're often here in California, possibly through the wine country. I think we've talked a little bit about that. So, yeah. Um, one of the things I want to also mention is is that you attended the 100 Women in Hedge Fund, now called 100 Women in Finance. Um, you were the only one of the only men in the room with 100 to 200 women. Let's talk a little bit about that. It's pretty bold of you. Yeah, it was an interesting experience, and I have gone to – many hundred women of hedge fund events, again, now hundred women in finance and certain things you never forget, you know, certain memorable experiences, hopefully a lot of them good uh, and unfortunately some of them bad. And I've attended several of their events and I will never forget. Uh, and I've gone to probably over a thousand hedge fund events in 15 years, you know, over a uh, you know, hundred a year typically. And the first time I went, there were roughly 200, 250 women in the room and about five guys, five men. And the first time I went, it was a little bit awkward and, and frankly, probably very awkward. It, it just, you know, imagine being you know, one of the five men in a room of 200 women. Yes, we're all colleagues. Yes, we all work in the industry, but it was very, very different. And I remember it because I said to myself, now I know what it must be like for women, less so than it used to be. Uh, who are you know, entering the field of finance or Wall Street or hedge funds or private equity or venture capital. You know, like I said, back in the day, it was probably 10, 15 percent of my class at Wharton were women. And most hedge fund or private equity events is still only about 20 percent women. Now, 20 percent is more than uh, the five of us guys with 200 women in the room. But we got the point. It, it was very, very unusual. But I will say after that, after, uh, you know, three or four meetings, you know, we're all industry colleagues and, uh, you know, no one really paid much attention. But I remember the first time it was. Uh, it was definitely uh, very strange. And, and, and one more uh, quick offshoot of that. Uh, you know, people sometimes say, you know, how did you uh, meet your wife? And there's a couple of joke answers. We actually met at a party. But when we first started talking, it turns out we actually first met at a 100 Women in Hedge Funds event at a major Wall Street shop. And uh, we actually did not remember meeting at that event. Uh, we met at two of them, had no recollection of ever having met there. But it all worked out. Uh, all worked out years later. But it is definitely very different, and it does, you know, sort of put you in the shoes of what it must be like for women. And in the case of Wall Street, you know, other minorities and women are not a minority, but other minorities who go to events that are 80% or 85% filled with men, the vast majority of them who are, you know, Caucasian. It must be a little bit challenging to try to go to these events and sort of break into the industry or try to advance in the industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that leads me to my next question. You know, how do you and the industry, uh, in terms of getting more women interested in finance and Wall Street? Sure. I mean, I'll dig into the question in a second, but I think one has to sort of first sort of step way back and go back 20 years. 
uh, no amount of recruiting, no amount, and I'll get into what we do, no amount of recruiting, no amount of, call it affirmative action, reach out, is ever going to be enough. We've got to go back 20 years to when today's women and tomorrow's women are girls 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and, you know, around the dinner table have mom and dad make sure that they are girls just like their boys or if they're introduced to finance, also get some introduction, are encouraged to pursue things like math and science and so forth. Uh, because I remember when I was in high school, uh, I was on two teams. Uh, I was on one of our soccer teams in high school and also on the chess and math team. And, you know, no surprise, there was a women's soccer team and a men's soccer team. And you can imagine they both played soccer. Okay. But as you would probably guess correctly, the math team and the chess team were about 90% male and 10% female. So the point is, if you want to have more adult women who are engineers and hedge fund managers and private equity PMs and so forth, it's going to take really a parental and societal movement to expose more girls when they're growing up to science and math and finance and the, you know the so-called STEM curriculum, because no amount of recruiting 20 years later is going to end up with 50% of the industry being women, uh, if only 15% of the business school class is women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that makes sense 100%, and I'm glad you brought that up. And, you know, it's been really a pleasure just listening to you know, from you. And, and that's one of the reasons why I really wanted you to come onto the show and give an insight look as, as far as in your world and what is that really shaping up like and what is that? What do you see the trend in terms of where, where we are now and where it's going? With regard to uh, sort of Wall Street. Yeah, well, women in finance or let's say, you know, a, a, them being, you know, general partners or, or whatever have you in the whole VC or PE world. Where do you see that? Well, the trend continues to grow upward. I mean, I've been in the alternative investment space for 15 years. And while I haven't counted uh, the number of women at industry events and who are PMs, well, I haven't counted manually. There's clearly been an increase uh, from, let's call it single digits into low double digits. And that's It's a start, obviously, but not nearly enough. In fact, uh, you know, the way that 100 women in hedge funds got their original name was there literally were allegedly just 100 women in hedge funds and maybe they were rounding up, maybe they were rounding down, you know, but in an industry that now has you know, roughly eight to 15,000 hedge funds, no one's quite sure. And, you know, tens of thousands of people working in it, you know, the notion of that there were only 100 women in hedge funds is really kind of scary. It's clearly moved on, you know, greatly from those points. And you know, various organizations have a lot more women in leadership, both in hedge and private equity uh, and venture. You know, but uh, things take time. And like I said, there's really no way of instantly waving a magic wand and accelerating it. Uh, you know, we do try to recruit women uh, for senior spots uh, by going to hedge fund events and speaking with the various you know cap intro teams and people intro teams at the prime brokers. Uh, but for example, recently we did a search for a hedge fund CFO, uh, top hedge fund CFO, and we got roughly about 100 resumes in. And I don't remember the exact number of resumes we got from women, but for hedge fund CFOs, it was, I forget if it was, it was either zero, one, or two. It was very, very few. So you know, I think it's really going to take, you know, not just outreach, uh, when women are in their 20s or 30s to help them achieve and get into more senior positions. But like I said before, encouraging them you know, when they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old to go into the STEM fields and to get exposed to the math and the science uh, and the chess team as well, and to hopefully then motivate them to you know, apply to the business schools, just like they are now more than 50% of the medical schools. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? They have questions. They're looking to raise capital for their fund. How can they get a hold of you? Uh, sure. Uh, actually, I'll get, answer that question in one second. There's two other things I wanted to mention about women-run funds, if I may, because uh, we've actually studied, I think, two fascinating things. Uh, how do women-run funds compare to men-run funds? And there's exceptions in every direction, obviously. But there is one thing that has been documented, and that is that Women-run funds tend to 
have less tail risk than men run funds. What that means is uh, that women tend to be, on average, exceptions in every direction, women tend to be more attuned to risk than men are and are a little bit more conservative. And this is in a good way to risk than men are. So studies have shown that there are great men run funds, obviously, and great women run funds. But the number of funds that have a huge, a more common left tail experience, a major drawdown, you know, uh, more substantial impairment of capital and so forth, tend to be less of that with women run funds who are a bit more sensitive to risk. And an extraordinary corollary to that, which has come out recently, is there have been studies showing how women and men tend to respond to avoiding coronav the coronavirus pandemic. So for example, studies have shown that everything else being equal, geography, political affiliation, what have you, women are more likely to wear a mask to prevent coronavirus than men are, even though the evidence shows clearly that it dramatically reduces the chances of your catching or conveying coronavirus, everything else being equal. That is to say, men are more risk takers, maybe even more stubborn, more arrogant, and women, everything else being equal, tend to wear coronavirus masks more than men. And similarly, studies have shown that countries that are led by women, presidents, prime ministers, and so forth, have done a noticeably better job, again, on average, exceptions in all directions, than countries that have been led by men, where the women have been more sensitive to risk uh, and a little bit less uh, hell-bent and not the so-called alpha male in terms of being more conservative and taking the coronavirus seriously. So both in investing and in coronavirus, women on average seem to be doing better than Very men in handling both. Mm, very interesting. I like when you give me those facts. That's that's really quite interesting. Um, but um, I, I do see that, so I, I appreciate bringing that up. Yeah, so another way of putting so, it yeah. is that the alpha female, the alpha female is an investor, a risk taker, but maybe a little bit more thoughtful risk taker than their average than their average alpha male, on average, with exceptions in every direction, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate bringing that up, like I said. So let's talk to our listeners, you know, a little bit of how they can get a hold of you, how they can utilize your service. I think that they, um, if they go on to YouTube, there's a great video I linked in on, on the blog post that I created for you. So a great video that everybody should watch of you. Oh, oh, oh sure. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's, the, that's the video of the 44 uh, top fundraiser secrets and tips of the trade. I mean, the best thing is to take a look at the Crawford Ventures uh, website, obviously, www.crawfordventures.com. Uh, you can download the uh, the PowerPoint there on how to raise capital. You can uh, also contact me through the website or the email. Unsurprisingly, is ecats at crawfordventures.com. It's also on the uh, the website. There's links to several videos on how to raise capital. Uh, happy to help anybody any way we can. Uh, if we can raise capital for them, happy to do so. Uh, also, uh, on a personal note, uh, very proud. We've helped, I think, roughly now 15, 16 people get jobs in the industry, probably maybe closer to two dozen by now. Uh, have helped eight people get married. No one in the alternative industry yet. Uh, eight other people <laughs> have, have eight other people get married. And so basically, whatever we can do to help somebody who's looking to break into or to advance their career or to raise money, uh, if we can do it, uh, we're certainly happy to do it. We have about 30,000 people uh, who are subscribers to our alternative investment newsletter. Uh, I've got about, I think, uh, almost 16,000 LinkedIn connections. So uh, we're ha happy to help anybody in any way that uh, that we can. I remember it was like breaking into the industry and going to my first uh, Wall Street event. I knew practically nobody there. So uh, happy to pay it forward and help anyone uh, looking to raise capital, uh, build a fund, uh, help their career, whatever uh, whatever I can do for them. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you again for coming on the show. I think this was really insightful. Um, some of the topics that uh, is not addressed and you address that. And so I really appreciate it on that level. And it was definitely a pleasure just uh, getting to know what you do on the daily. Well, fair enough, Rose. It's been great, uh, great speaking with you and hope, uh, hope this has been of help uh, uh, to you and uh, to your listeners. And then the uh, pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again. Bye-bye. 
Women in Business podcast is giving women a platform to share their stories while providing investors with opportunities for amazing deal flow. We're building a powerful online community of women entrepreneurs and investors. Join us on Facebook at Women in Business Podcast and be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. If you have a story to share with our listeners, apply to be a guest on womeninbusinesspodcast.com. Together, we can change the state of funding for women-owned businesses.